Hi, everybody. Welcome today to our second Codes for Climate in our Codes for Climate webinar series that MAPC has been organizing. And we're really excited about today's webinar, which will be focused on mass save electrification incentives for new construction programs. You probably all saw a little sign popped up that we are recording this webinar um, we're recording it so we can hopefully post it on MAPC web, MAPC's website and share this out um, with different folks who can't make it to the meeting today. If you prefer to not have your image captured in the recording, please feel free to keep your video off. Um, but want to let folks know we are recording this meeting, so if you could consent to that, we'd appreciate it. Um, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. We'd ask um, that you please keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking on the webinar, um, so we don't hear any of your personal conversations going on. There is a chat feature in the webinar that you can use. If you go to your toolbar and click on chat, you're welcome to put in any questions you have as the presentation goes on into the chat feature. Or if you're having any issues with some Zoom technical issues, feel free to put those in the chat and our team can help you with that. And we'd also ask that folks please try to rename yourself in Zoom so we know who you are in your organization. You can rename yourself in Zoom by clicking on your um, image and the three little dots in the upper right hand corner and there's a rename option. Um, or clicking on your name in the participant list if you right click there you can update your name, so we know your community or the organization that you're with. Um, I should also say hello, my name is Julie Curdy. I'm the director of the clean energy team at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and I'll be your host for today's webinar. And we had a few introductory polls we wanted to jump into at the start, so my colleague Sasha will pull those up. In just a moment. Great, so folks could take a, a moment to fill those out. There are two questions for you. The first is asking you about your affiliation today, what brings you here, just to help our speakers know and tailor their presentations. And then the second is just trying to get a sense of some of your familiarity with Mass Saves new construction programs. All right, so we'll give folks another bit of time to fill those out. Okay. So it looks like the results of the poll is that most of you are here as municipal staff um, or committee members from town or municipal committees, such as energy or sustainability committees. We also have some elected officials in the room, local or state level, some clean energy folks, um, a few in the other category, residents, building trades and nonprofits represented as well. So it's really nice to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and then we have a, a variety of experience in the room, but it sounds like most folks kind of fall within the three categories in the poll that range from new to the topic to a little experience to some experience with mass save programs. So I think the presenters will try to make sure that they tailor their material today so everybody um, can learn a lot about mass saves, electrification incentives, and the programs that have come into existence in the last year. So we'll stop sharing the poll. Um, just to provide a little bit of context if you aren't familiar about um, what MAPC is, MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, is the regional planning agency for the greater Boston region. So we serve the 101 cities and towns in and around Boston that you see on the map here. Um, we divide our region into subregions that are located um, and labeled on this map so you can see where your community may fall. And we're a staff of about 100 different planners and experts who work to provide additional staff capacity to local governments to do their planning and implementation work. Um, specifically, um, I and my colleagues sit on the clean energy team at MAPC, and we work on climate mitigation and resilience work, helping communities to develop climate action plans and clean energy plans, and then to focus on implementing programs and plans and policies. And so if you haven't had a chance to interact with us yet, welcome today. We're really excited to see you, and we'll share our contact information at the end. Um, so we have a pretty robust program to get through today. We're almost done with our introductions and housekeeping. Um, then we'll jump into a presentation on the commercial new construction programs, um, move into electric vehicle incentive programs, and then we'll hear an example from the Acton Boxborough Regional School District of how they've used some of those commercial and EV incentive programs that you'll hear about. 
Then we'll shift gears and talk about residential new construction programs, both for single family and multifamily housing. And we'll hear of another example um, from the nonprofit group POA that builds affordable housing. And they'll talk about a project they've constructed in Brewster Woods on the Cape as another example of how to use some of the residential incentive programs. At the end, we'll have at least 20 minutes for Q&A from the audience. We'll be taking questions from the chat. Um, and some of my colleagues will be gathering and organizing all of those as we go. So if you have questions while presenters are speaking, feel free to put those in the chat as we go. And we'll organize those and try to get through as many as we can during the Q&A session. And then we'll also try to answer as many as we can in the chat as we go. Um, and if there's any we don't get to at the end, um, we'll try our best to see if we can circle back and answer those um, for folks afterwards. Um, we do have a copies of all the slides that we'll be able to send out to the presenters to the participants afterwards, um, along with a copy of the recording of the meeting, and then we'll also post all of this information on our website. Um, so don't worry if you missed something, you'll be able to access it later as well. So um, I'm going to um, share a new set of slides in just a moment, but first I want to introduce our next speakers. Um, so our first speakers for today will be Kim Cullinane. Um, she currently supervises Eversource's Tri-State Residential and Commercial New Construction Energy Efficiency Team, and she is the instigator of today's webinar, so thank you, Kim. Um, Kim has worked in the field of energy efficient and sustainable buildings since 2002, so brings a wealth of experience today. Um, she has been a net zero program development lead for MassSave and for Energize Connecticut, and a thought leader in the decarbonized building space. And then our other speaker talking about commercial new construction programs will be Denise Rouleau. She is National Grid's Massachusetts Commercial New Construction Program Manager. She has over 25 years of experience in the energy efficiency and clean energy fields. She's worked on program strategy, evaluation, and implementation at all levels of government and in the utility space, and has developed and deployed innovative energy efficiency programs. Um, so I will pull up their slides and they will take it away with that presentation. Here we go. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate that. Um, so I want to start by saying that thank you again to MAPC for hosting us today. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, what we're going to be doing for the rest of this session today is talking about the various new construction, um, commercial new construction, residential new construction, and electric vehicle programming that is available. Um, so many of you are municipal folks, so this, these, uh, these programs are available to you for your own municipal buildings. If you're building a new uh, municipal building or uh, renovating, uh, gut renovating a, a municipal building. But we also want you to know about these programs so that you can also communicate them, at least to a limited extent, to your various constituencies. So to residents and to um, commercial entities, developers, et cetera, who may be building in your cities and towns. <clears throat> we have our contact information in here. We want you to reach out to us, but it's helpful if you if you all are just ambassadors um, for us, then you you can bring this value to your constituencies. Um, so I just want to say that up front. So um, Denise and I are going to talk about commercial new construction first. We're going to move into some of the other subject areas after that. I want to just uh, mention at the top, we are Mass Save. So I work for Eversource. Denise works for National Grid. Um, we are the entities of Mass Save. So Eversource, National Grid, Liberty Utilities, Berkshire Gas, Cape Light Compact. When you're reaching out to Mass Save, you're reaching out to one of um, those entities there. This is the commercial new construction program I'm going to talk about. We also do major gut renovations as part of this. So any non multifamily, non residential commercial new construction major renovation will go through the participation patient pathways that we offer. Um, and so just big picture for people who don't know, um, MassSave exists to help our ratepayers, our customers, reduce energy and reduce carbon. So that's what we do. That's our jobs. That's what we do every day. Um, and so we have money at our disposal that we can use to buy down the incremental costs of more expensive, um, higher efficient and lower carbon equipment and systems that can go into buildings. So that's what we do. We pay, we pay incentives to our customers to help them afford to be able to put this um, you know, low energy use equipment, low carbon equipment and, and systems into their buildings. We also provide technical assistance. And the money that we have at our disposal comes from our ratepayers. So our ratepayers being our customers, so anyone who pays a retail bill in our service territory is paying by statute, by state requirement into a fund that these entities on screen pay back to our customers in the form of these programs that we're going to talk about. So I just wanted people to understand kind of the big picture of what, what we're doing here. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk, I'm going to go kind of quickly because we have a lot of content for today, but um, I'm going to give a little bit of information about the kind of big picture regulatory legislative policy um, you know, context that we're all operating in. Then we're going to talk about the emphasis of the commercial new construction program, how to participate, the value we add. Next slide. So I think many of you that are on this call understand that we're operating in a, in a very interesting time where there's a lot of activity on the legislative front, on the state side, on the federal side, local policies, um, codes changing a lot of emphasis right now on decarbonization in particular, low energy use and decarbonization are, are really the name of the game. And the mass save programming that we're going to be talking about for the rest of this session today um, really fits kind of at the nexus of all of this activity. We've got code change. I know you had a webinar a couple of weeks ago with MAPC and many of may have attended where we talked about the new codes um, and we've got a new stretch code that's coming into play. And that's on July 1. We've got the specialized uh, opt-in code, which is basically a net zero code. Um, these programs that we're going to talk about today can help your constituencies, your customers, your your clients, if you will, in, in your cities and towns, um, achieve those, those high levels of efficiency. So that's what we're here to support. Next slide, please. We're going to be talking about some of these terms today, and I want to just level set. So so net zero or zero net energy, there's also zero net carbon, there's zero net emissions. Those terms are all very closely related um, and they have very specific definitions of each one. But generally the principle is drive down the overall energy use of your building or anticipated energy use of the design of your building as low as you can. And then hopefully offset that energy use over the course of the year by either on-site renewable generation, off-site renewable generation, purchasing certificates, renewable energy certificates, purchasing green power. So the principle being getting that energy use down as low as possible being in the beginning. And we represent that energy use by EUI. So EUI is an energy use intensity, and it's a measure of a building's total, either predicted or actual, energy use, annual energy use, normalized or divided by square footage. So it's a single number. And we kind of compare it to a miles per gallon metric where you know, you know, if you know when you know what a good miles per gallon metric is for your car, we are learning over time what good EYs are for different building types. And they do vary by by building types. So if you go to the next slide, this comes into play where you know we've got two different scenarios on the screen here. So on the left side of the screen, we've got kind of a heavier building that is has a higher consumption. So that is a higher EUI. That's not optimal. Um, we can't offset that on the balance by solar or by, by renewable energy in any way. Um, so what we're trying to do is trim down that building. So we go to the right side of the slide and we see a trimmer building representing a lower EUI. So consumption is EUI. Um, and that in that scenario, it can be offset, offset by renewables. And so what we focus on with our commercial new construction program is the left side of that balance. It's that EUI reduction or the energy use reduction. That's what we're really trying to get you to do is reduce your EUI. Um, we have other programs available um, statewide and through MassSave that, and, and through our companies that can help interconnect. If you are doing solar, there's the SMART program if you're doing solar, um, but we're gonna focus on that consumption side on the EUI side for the next few minutes. Next slide, please. Um, we do have significant support for building decarbonization and, and low EUI, as I mentioned. So the name of the game is really getting all of us, um, as we move into a, a you know future where we're really looking at low carbon, we want to get people off fossil fuels. So stop burning, to, to, to stop burning fossil fuels in their buildings. And so that really boils down to electric heating and cooling solutions. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen on the right side, air source heat pumps, there's a technology called variable refrigerant flow or VRF and ground source heat pumps. These are all, all electric heating and cooling solutions for buildings. Um, and so you can see the support there from the mass safe program for those commercial projects. At, at we offer our incentives on eight dollar uh, per ton basis. So $800 a ton for air source, 1200 for variable refrigerant flow and a significant 4,500 for ground source. And those incentives are, are offered regardless of the different commercial pathway you choose or we guide you to, those incentives will be available um, for any commercial new construction major renovation project that participates with us. Next slide. 
So Denise is gonna talk about the pathways in a little more detail. Thanks, Kim. So Kim's given us a good sort of grounding in what is happening in the environment and some of the concepts of the program. I'm gonna dive down into the incentives and the pathways that we have available for participating in the new construction program. Be aware you're going to have a link at the end. You'll be able to get a lot of information. And due to time constraints, I'm just going to touch on a lot of this information. You'll have these slides. And just know Kim and I are here. Our staff is here to support and help you decide and your you know, design teams decide which pathway to go through. The first path is our net zero and low EUI buildings pathway. Our focus there is to really help customers design to a low energy use intensity target, but also the hallmark of this pathway is to also to monitor your building so that you're actually um, performing at the EUI target that your building is designed to. This is a modeled pathway, so the building needs to be modeled. Um, path two is our whole building EUI reduction pathway. This is for buildings that are larger and somewhat complex that might not be able to go through the zero net energy pathway or don't necessarily want to, to monitor their building use over time. They could be such as a corn shell building, which uh, you don't have your tenants in yet, so you might not know uh, how and you might not be there to monitor the building on the other end. And then that is a modeled um, pathway as well. Then we have a path three, which is kind of a, a all encompassing pathway. We focus on uh, anything that doesn't necessarily fall into path one or two. So now we have pathways to approach um, your project. And I'm gonna emphasize the earlier you engage with us, the better, particularly on path one. Uh, next slide, please. So the it, and this is what that just illustrated was that both path one and two really do focus on energy use intensity of the building, looking at the whole building, not pieces of the building, but the whole building. And again, here we're really focusing on the design EUI and then monitoring the EUI in operations. The incentives, as I'll show you in a minute, are divided up in that way. We provide some uh, support in terms of the uh, a zero net energy expert to provide feedback to you along the way. And we also have what we call an optional verification incentive where we provide some support to monitor your building through the first year. And next, please. So I'll touch on the incentives, and here you'll see that we pay uh, for both path one and two on a dollar amount per square foot basis. We do that because we think it's easier for our customers to be able to figure out really what is a, what is at stake in terms of the incentives. Here you'll see that we have two tiers. Tier one is for a, a lower EUI. And if you can't quite meet that lower EUI, we have a tier two, which you might not get as much incentive, but the EUI is a little higher. The heat pump incentives are applicable through all three pathways. Here, you'll see that we sort of add those together and they are paid at the end of construction and verification of the project. And then after you've reached your steady state of your building, we monitor, the customer will monitor for one year period of time, 12 months, provide the data back to the utility. We will weather normalize it and then determine whether you've actually achieved the EUI that you were designing to in operations. And if so, we'll pay an additional uh, $1.50 a square foot. We also have a certification stipend which we would pay if a customer is interested in certifying their building to be zero net energy. Next, please. Here's just a really high level understanding of we have a lot of incentives that are uh, at stake now. We have increased the incentives, particularly for path one, and the heat pump incentives are really rich. And this, I think, gives you an example 
compared to what kind of incentives we had previously for this new elementary school all in, it's more than $2.1 million. And that's a, you know, a really big increase over the kind of incentives that you've seen before. And that's why we really want to get out to our customers, let them know that this kind of money is available to electrify. Next, please. Our path two is for uh, focusing on EUI. Again, the only difference here is you're not monitoring the building on the other end. We provide some technical assistance and the optional verification incentive is available here as well. Next, please. And here's an example of the incentives and you'll see the tiers over to the left. Um, the basic understanding here is that the lower the EUI, the higher the energy uh, incentive that you'll achieve. The heat pump adders are included in, and we do divide uh, a little bit across building types in terms of how much you need to achieve uh, it below our baseline. Next, please. So this is just an understanding of the optional verification incentive that's available for path one and path two. We put this in place because we saw there was a gap, at least for the first year, in terms of commissioning a building, but also understanding the energy being used by those systems. And this is to add an additional scope of work to have someone do a desk audit, pull data and take a look at it and provide some feedback at like two, six, eight month intervals, 12 month in order to let you know, are you on course? Are you off course? Do you need to do some corrections? Or, you know, you might well be on course and it's good to know. Um, next, please. And for path three, we bring in projects that might not fit neatly into path one or path two. Some of those projects are smaller buildings that either are having one or two measures in the building they want to look at. Either they're not looking at the whole building or it could be a tenant fit out. It could be that there's an industrial load uh, like cannabis or some industrial plants that uh, are doing a building. So here we pay 35 cents a KWH savings and $2 a therm savings. The heat pump incentives that you saw in path one and path two are applicable as well. Next, please. And there you go, Kim. Yeah, so just to wrap up our session again on the commercial new construction program, what can you do? And I'm sort of speaking to the municipal folks here. Um, so, you know, hopefully you can bring these programs to bear on any municipal projects that are, are, are going up, you know, or in the planning stages in your cities and towns. So we definitely want to see those participate in, in our programs and we want to engage really early. Um, but we would really strongly encourage you to um, work with project teams in your communities um, to advise them to set energy or carbon goals. So like an EOI target for their new construction and major renovation project. Suggest that they include language in their RFS for design services, setting an EOI target, setting net zero aspirations, setting passive house aspirations if they have them, and referencing the MassSafe program participation, because then you're really going to be attracting, you, know, you or your constituencies will be attracting design teams that are capable of doing all these things. And then finally, advise the project teams to contact their MassSafe sponsors as early as possible. It's really in feasibility and conceptual design that is the critical critical time to bring us in um, for the highest incentives that we can offer. And we do want to work with as many customers as possible. Next slide. And then just in terms of value add, again, I want to just emphasize that these programs can help your, um, your constituencies meet the stretch code. Stretch code is very stringent now. Um, if you're considering adopting that specialized opt-in code, we want to be there to support those projects um, and make you feel comfortable that, you know, there's support out there. If you were to adopt stretch uh, specialized code, there's support out here to help your, um, you know, your commercial and then your residential customers, you know, meet those high levels of stringency. Um, so we, we do that by providing our incentives and providing our technical assistance. And I think the next slide is just our contact information. So um, Denise and I presented today on behalf of all of the MassSave program administrators that you see here. So you see our contact information listed um, as well as the other program administrators.
And that's it for commercial. Thanks so much, Kim and Denise. And maybe we could ask you if you wouldn't mind dropping your contact information into the chat as well. And then we will also share that out um, with everybody in terms of the slides um, following the webinar. Um, so really appreciate all that information and the context you provided about how these programs can really help communities meet the new stretch code and if they choose to opt into the specialized code. Um, so our next speaker today is Steve Conti. Um, so Steve has been working on Eversource's Make Ready program in Massachusetts since its early days in 2019. And he'll share more about that. His primary role is project management, but he does work on all aspects of EV programs. Um, in addition to working in Massachusetts on EV programs, he's also the program manager for Eversource's New Hampshire EV program um, and its energy as a service program at Hanscom Air Source base. So Steve is quite busy, so we're really glad he could join us today um, to share more about EV incentive programs and how those can be part of projects that are both commercial and residential. So I'll pass it over to you, Steve. Thank you. Um, and actually, if I could pause for one quick moment, um, I do see Senator Barrett has a, a hand up and thank you so much, Senator, for joining us today. Um, did you want to jump in? Uh, hi. No, I I uh, anticipate asking a question after Steve presents and your program is over, Julie. Thank you for acknowledging me, but it, it's a question we can reserve to the end. Okay, thank you so much for joining us and everybody who's here. Over to Steve. Great, thank you, Julie, and thank you to uh, MAPC for, for having me today and looking forward to speaking with you all about our EV program opportunities. Um, so I guess just before I dive in, just to uh, kind of level set a little bit, um, what I'll be discussing is Eversource's uh, electric vehicle charging program. Um, National Grid does have a very similar program that was also recently approved by our regulators. And um, you know a lot of the content I'll be sharing is very similar to what they would, but um, this is more from Eversource's perspective. And also just to clarify, this, um, this program is not considered a mass save program. It's really its own kind of incentive program that our, our regulators have approved for, for us. So to dive right in, um, I guess the first, let's see if I can get the next slide here. There we go. So much, you know, in the same way that Kim and Denise were talking about, um, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the built environment through some of those energy efficiency incentive programs um, that MassSave offers. Um, we also don't want to forget about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. Uh, you can see by you know, this graph here that the transportation sector actually makes up the largest uh, portion of greenhouse gas emissions in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it's really a, a great opportunity there to uh, achieve our carbon reduction goals as a, uh, as a state is to tackle that sector. Um, the best way to go about doing this is, as I'm sure you know, transition from away from uh, gas powered vehicles and toward electric or other alternative uh, fuel source vehicles. And what Eversource and National Grid and uh, Unitel actually have a program as well. What we've kind of been tasked with is to help um, you know, further that adoption of EV um, electric vehicles by enabling more of the charging infrastructure in our, in our territories. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with you know, some form of EV charging. You've seen them maybe driving around town or maybe you have a an EV and you have a charger in your home, but this is sort of a breakdown of really what constitutes an EV charger. Um, you know, level one is really uh, more of a trickle charge that you'll see from um, you know, a charger plugged into your, your outlet at your home, your normal 120 volt outlet. Uh, there are also level two chargers, which are more of a medium speed charge. Uh, you can plug those into a higher voltage outlet, outlet at your home, or you can also find these more common at um, out in, you know, outside of the home at workplaces, uh, public settings, shopping centers, et cetera. Those can charge up your car in you know, six to eight hours for the most part. And then the higher speed level three chargers, uh, otherwise known as DC fast chargers, uh, those are typically uh, found more along travel corridors. Uh, you'll see them at rest stops along the highway. Um, and those are looking to give you more of a gas station type of experience without fueling your car. Um, you'll ideally be able to charge most of the way in you know, 30 minutes to an hour. Those types of sites really require a lot more infrastructure um, and uh, you know, just higher power capacity. And Eversource and National Grid, our programs are really more focused around incentivizing level two and DC fast. Uh, as the utilities, we're really well positioned to uh, work in this space in terms of uh, enabling this, this charging infrastructure out in our uh, service territories. 
uh, cable and conduit and transformers. That's really what we do best as a, as utilities. So um, you know, a lot of that translates nicely to EV charging installations. And that's a bit, a bit above a bit about EV charging in general and uh, kind of where we're taking it. Um, so our regulators approved for us a, um, an EV program back in 2018. This was our phase one program. Um, and we had a lot of success over the last uh, five years. We spent $55 million um, across our territory and were able to cover 100% of the cost of infrastructure at approved charging sites, as well as uh, the charging stations themselves and environmental justice communities. Um, you know, quite a few charging sites were um, completed and you know, a lot of charging ports to, uh, to show for it that are currently being used. Um, and you can really see the concentration there around the Metro Boston area. That is definitely where we see the most activity. So I'm sure many of you have uh, possibly seen some of the stations we've installed or participated yourselves. And um, hopefully we'll see a few more as we uh, move ahead with, uh, with phase two. So phase two of our EV program, we had actually filed back in 2021 and it took uh, our regulators a little bit of time to, to get back to us on the uh, the approval, but we did receive the uh, the approval for the program just before the new year, uh, a couple of months ago. And that um, the program that was approved is $188 million over the next four years through uh, 2026 to spend on um, many different uh, charging incentive programs uh, throughout our territory. So the biggest one is gonna be the commercial program. This is really a continuation of the make ready incentives that we had in phase one. Uh, we're also gonna have EV charging rebates or for the chargers themselves um, outside of environmental justice communities, which I'll show in a little bit, but that's uh, a new addition. Um, another new program segment is the residential program, which I'm sure many of you would like to uh, discuss with some of your constituents or other you know, neighbors in your communities. But we now have um, an opportunity to offer rebates um, for the purchase of home chargers. Um, that website and the application process is currently being stood up and should be available soon. Some other new uh, incentive opportunities are in the fleet charging space. Um, we previously didn't have anything for fleet vehicles, but now we can fortunately offer make ready and uh, charging station rebates. And we also have a couple of um, pilot programs, such as a medium heavy duty um, public fleet charging program and a fast charging hub program for environmental justice communities. So the commercial program, which I mentioned is really the biggest uh, part of our, our phase two. Uh, you can kind of see here, it's a bit, a bit wordy, but this is the best breakdown for some of the incentives we can offer. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm highlighting on the Kind of the far right, the make ready rebates are really what we've been doing the last four years. And we can um, cover up to 100% of the cost of all the infrastructure for charging sites across public workspace, fleets, and multi unit dwellings. A uh, new requirement, though, is that for that rebate, you have to apply for the Mass EVIP program or any other federal or state grant programs for uh, charging stations or infrastructure. And then kind of the, the more tiered breakdown of uh, rebates here in the middle, the uh, envir or sorry, the um, EV charging station rebates. As I mentioned, these are a bit new for us outside of environmental justice communities. So it's definitely going to be helpful for customers to be able to pay for those charging stations. Um, but we do have a higher rebate level for folks who are in those EJCs, with the highest level being uh, allocated towards folks that are in an EJC that meets the income criteria specifically. And you can kind of see how it breaks down among fleets as well as uh, multi-unit dwellings and some different um, eligibility requirements. Uh, you know, the biggest ones being um, the EV charging rebates in public workspace, they do have to be at publicly accessible sites. Uh, for fleets, we can only offer charging station rebates for public fleets only. So, you know, municipal fleets would qualify uh, state agency fleet vehicles. And then for multi-unit dwellings, uh, we can only offer uh, rebates kind of across the board actually for park, uh, for charging at non-deeded or assigned parking spaces. And kind of uh, just to break down of the ownership model, uh, we'll pay for all the infrastructure in most cases, uh, and we'll end up owning all, all of the infrastructure up to the meter. And then the customer would then own infrastructure, including the charging stations behind the meter. 
and the customer would be responsible with ideally with help from our our new rebates to be purchasing the charging stations themselves whereas the infrastructure eversource would hire a contractor to work with you to install that uh, equipment free of charge at your site and i know that there is a focus on new construction with this conversation in particular um, it's more or less the same incentive um, except that we are allowing cuts our site hosts to use their own contractor as opposed to us bringing a, uh, an EV contractor on board. Uh, this way, you know, you don't have too many cooks in the kitchen. You can continue working with the contractor who's already building the rest of your, uh, your development. Um, we're happy to assist with the design, however, if needed. And it's still kind of being ironed out, but we will have more of a set um, prescriptive rebate available for uh, the make ready. It'll be a certain dollar amount per charging port that you install. And then the rebates for the charging stations would follow that same tiered structure as I had shown on the, uh, the last slide for, for retrofit. And just a quick uh, snapshot of our residential program. Um, although I'm sure the majority of you would be participating in commercial, you might want to just discuss the residential offerings with your neighbors in the community. Um, we are able to offer um, greater incentives, I'm not going to read through each of these here, but greater incentives for folks who are enrolled in a low income rate. Um, if you have, if you are on that rate or you'd like to be on that rate um, as part of your residential account with Eversource, you'd be eligible for uh, kind of greater incentives on the charging stations, uh, or the charging station that you install at your home, as well as any wiring upgrades that need to happen to make the, uh, the charging stations operational. So you can kind of see the breakdown there. And like I said, we're in the process of standing up this new uh, program offering and you know the application portal online and everything like that. So more to come there, um, but hopefully in the next month or so, we should be able to start accepting applications. And just to clarify here, um, multi-unit dwellings, um, properties with five or more units, we would they would fall more under our commercial program. And we do have uh, specifically uh, incentive amounts for MUDs. But this is really for one to four unit uh, small residential. And for eligibility, uh, we would just ask that the, um, the homeowner or the renter purchase a uh, charging station that's on our qualified products list, uh, submit to us the cost related, and you'll be able to provide the, uh, the incentive that way through our, um, you know, our rebate processing portal. And we do require that anybody who uh, participates in this uh, program also enroll in our managed charging in order to receive the incentive. Um, so that is sort of a separate um, program of other sources in our demand response group where they are able to manage the, uh, the charging output at your stations to you know, reduce that output during peak demand events on the grid. And I think that should hopefully be about 10 minutes. I don't want to the clock, but um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to myself. My email is right there, or we have a general email inbox um, for the commercial program, and we ha have a new email from uh, Clear Result for the residential program as well. But I'll put my contact in the chat right after this in case you have any other questions. Thanks so much, Steve, for providing that overview about how some of the EV charging incentive programs can complement mass save and help buildings reach their electrification and net zero goals. Um, and if folks want to look into the chat for that contact information for the commercial and residential program, um, Steve will drop it there. Um, so next on our agenda is Kate Crosby. Um, so Kate is the energy manager for the Acton Boxborough Regional School District. She's also a member of the Department of Energy Resources Green Communities Advisory Council. Um, Kate has been in her current position for 12 years and she's shepherded through many innovative and leading net zero projects in the school district that she'll talk to us about today. Um, so we're really honored to have you here today, Kate. Thank you. And feel free to share your screen and slides whenever you'd like. Um, it's wonderful to see everybody here today. There are a lot of um, colleagues and champions in this group, and it's great to have everybody here working working on these on these goals. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my um, slides. And can Julie, can you see those? Yes, it looks good. Super do. And um, I'm going. The thing I'm going to focus on most today is work that we've done to open up a, a new all electric. 
a geothermal school building, which opened in September. And um, we're still doing a little bit of infrastructure work behind those scenes in the back of the house, but the building has been occupied and open and full of kids since September. And it's, it's great indeed. Um, we did, uh, as, as um, Kim and Denise described, we set a, a, a low EUI target from the beginning. And we'll be talking about that as I go through. Um, um, this is the, uh, Aero Street was, is the uh, design team, Skanska is the OPM and Consigli is the general contractor for the building. And you see a rough layout of it here. Uh, and we'll, we'll be talking about more details on the next slide. It is, the building is significant because it's large. It has two elementary schools in it and a preschool. So it's sort of two and a half programs, 175,000 square feet. It is, uh, um, if you can see my cursor here, it's the EUI target was set early uh, per the advice of, um, of, our, of our allies in uh, Eversource and National Grid. We set, a, we set a target of 28 KBTUs per square foot as the EUI target. The building is um, zero net energy <clears throat> or will be zero net energy. Uh, heating and cooling is provided by geothermal plus heat exchangers inside the building. And there is an electric boiler as a backup for the coldest days. It is an all electric building, although there is an emergency generator on site with, which is powered by diesel, should it be needed. Uh, there will be solar plus storage being installed to make the building zero net. We are installing um, EV chargers through the EV Make Ready program. And in addition, the roof collects rainwater and um, that's used for flushing toilets. So that's a fun thing too. Um, we, we did, um, I, the support from Mass Save was absolutely essential. Um, I heard at a utility conference, the, the advice to start early took that to heart um, and was, we, we, we did incorporate that goal quite early in our discussions. Um, the support from Mass Save, um, and I have to give a shout out to Kim Cullane who was active uh, then um, and great to have Denise active as well now. Um, it provided credibility, it, it, it made people believe that zero net was actually something for us to shoot for. If Eversource believed in it, people that, that caught people's attention, um, provided momentum, they provided uh, technical help, and they also were able to confirm incentives that were substantial and confirm them ahead of time, as opposed to having it be at the end of the process. That was all extremely helpful. We did put net zero in the RFS that we issued for both the owner's project manager and the design team, and that was very helpful in making our, our um, intentions explicit. The building is actually modeling a 23.6, uh, an EUI of 23.6. So we, we are modeling it lower than the target that we set. Uh, and you wanna start early to maximize your benefits. <clears throat> this is um, a solar, just a couple shots of things that we did to help the building achieve a low EUI. There was a solar radiation benefit study looking at how to um, orient and shape the building. Um, and there was a daylight study done on how to balance the most daylight into the building to reduce how much we need to spend on lighting. Um, and we did a life cycle cost analysis with the engineering firm looking at different options for HVAC. This is a very busy slide, but this um, square, the square with the tiny little print, you're gonna have a hard time reading, but there were four scenarios we looked at for HVAC. Um, and the two that were um, rose to the top was a high efficiency gas number two or a geothermal scenario. And it turned out that when we looked at the long-term life cycle cost analysis, they were very, very close. Um, and uh, the school building committee was able to vote for the geothermal system. Um, and, and we built this building on a conventional budget. There was no extra funding, nothing fancy. It just made sense financially to reach for it. <clears throat> it was not, not, a, not no, oh, very little extra. Um, when you look at the long term, it's a little more money to put it to install it, but it's cheaper to operate and that pays back over time. I want to mention also that the new IRA legislation that passed in August, this analysis that we did was in 2019. So this IRA legislation that just passed um, includes a 30% tax credit for geothermal. And that will that has changed the landscape and the and the way things pencil out. So you definitely want to get a life cycle cost analysis and look at the long. We asked for we got a 20 year life cycle life cycle cost analysis. We sent it back and asked for a 50 year one because that's when geothermal really shows its strength because it um, is very low operating cost and that was extremely helpful. Um, so when you put all that together, the building model that there's that 23.6. Um, 
And uh, it, that we achieve that partly because the envelope is really, we hope to achieve that because the envelope is really tight and well insulated. That's the foundational piece that's essential in new construction. Um, and then super efficient systems inside with the geothermal loop, the heat exchangers in the middle of the building, um, lighting and uh, the way we're circulating what's called low temp hot water. We'll see that in a minute. So this is these two blue circles. The, the, um, this is the, the building L-shaped here not, uh, under construction. And these two blue circles are pointing to the geothermal well fields. There are 65 wells uh, at a depth of 600 feet. I've learned to say, talk to my kids, it's like a Boston skyscraper turned upside down. <laughs> um, this is some of the drilling going on. This is the geothermal lines entering the mechanical room before it was completely built out. And this is, these are the heat exchangers that are in the center of the room, taking the, the geothermal system is over here on the far left. The heat exchangers boost that water to what's called low temp hot water, not as hot as boilers, but hot enough when circulated continuously to warm the building. That, that water is sent out through pipes and loops through the building and um, heating hot water and chilled water up to the rooftop units and also to these um, radiant panels, which are modern day radiators. And they are both of those systems. The rooftops are, of course, there are seven, seven big ones up on the roof. And then these radiant panels are all through the building as well. Um, I want to mention that the state, there's state policy that is, we also hope to see some revenue from this uh, uh, alternative energy credits. Uh, this has been discussed, but is not yet um, quite operational. Hope, hope we, we're hoping we're going to get some Q1 revenue for 2023. We'll see. Um, we're, we had a consultant call us. We anticipate we may get as much as, excuse me, $43,000 in uh, annual revenue, which will help offset some of the fuel costs to run the building. So, um, this, so then the next part of the planning is once you've got an efficient building with a low EUI, the next question is where are you going to get that power from, right? So that's a separate question. The big win is getting a building up with a, with a low EUI or planning for one. But then, but then you also want to take a look at where that power is going to be coming from. You, as as Kim was saying, you can buy renewable energy from offsite, and that's a completely legitimate way to go. You, the grid is cleaning up over time. You can just wait for the grid to get clean and push for policies to make it so. Um, our site afforded the ability to put up solar and a battery, so we we are going to do that. Um, there are going to be um, a lot of panels on the roof, solar on the roof, and then also a lot of solar on the on parking and a battery over here, which is one megawatt, two megawatt hours. That battery will help to decrease the cost of the electricity. It will also help to stabilize the grid. It will also help to reduce peaks and reduce carbon, <clears throat> excuse me, reduce carbon on the grid as well. So we're thrilled to have it there. Um, and um, I want to also shift for a minute and talk about our existing buildings. <clears throat> we took a look at our, our high school, which has 11 rooftop units that need to be replaced. And we did another life cycle cost analysis looking at those. And in fact, putting in electric replacements for these gas fired rooftop units is, is a, a much better deal than replacing them with gas. So the EUI drops from 71 to 37, cut in half almost. The gas goes to zero as you would expect. And we were able to do this study with a with a meta grant from DOER, like I mentioned. Um, and then here's the combined utility cost. So the new system, the all electric system, all electric system will have a lower energy cost than putting in gas. And that's because of the super efficiency of these new all electric units. So uh, the building, the extra cost to install them pays back in two years, and then we will make a we will earn two million eight hundred thousand dollars. Over the life of over the over the twenty year life cycle that this study looks at by going all electric, really astonishing and wonderful. Um, I want to mention too that um, real quick that um, back one more that um, down here at the bottom there is a nine hundred thousand dollar utility incentive that is not even reflected in the numbers. Of this. So it's already a good deal to go electric, and it's a screaming deal with this nine hundred thousand dollar utility incentive for MassSafe. So very exciting. Um, okay, and in addition, we, are, we wanted to look at our entire portfolio. And so we were able to collaborate with the Town of Acton and get a $70,000 grant through the um, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness um, or, uh, Program and uh, looked at uh, electrification timeline and plan for seven key municipal buildings. There's a link at the bottom for taking a look at that study. 
Uh, and that's also very exciting work. I had to just show this slide. This is the guys who did the study. Um, this is a, my favorite slide that they shared with us. There's an old fashioned radiator. Uh, this is a, a, a chapel at Carlton and they replaced it with a radiant panel. So that's a low temp hot water radiant panel, just like what's in the boardwalk, in our new boardwalk building. Um, I wanna also mention real quick that um, electricity prices are the way to go for municipalities because the, the electricity is more stable less inflation, less volatility over time. This slide right here, and there are a couple links down here with studies looking at this, this figure five, that, that dark blue line that runs through the middle is electricity pricing over decades. And these big swings is what's happening with natural gas. So the place to be for municipalities is with electricity. It's the most highly regulated fuel there is, and the price is stable and, non and not prone to inflation, unlike fossil fuels. Um, and, I, and we also have a, another battery on our main campus, um, which is providing $70,000 annual revenue to the district uh, for hosting it. And I had to put the batteries on wheels here, the electric school bus is coming in, which we're working hard on, like a lot of other school districts, hoping to figure out how to get there. And we need, as public entities, to be operating in line with the state and state goals. We are stewards of public buildings, and we need to figure out how to get our portfolio to a low carbon economy. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Kate, for sharing that real world example and all the great work you've been doing in Acton Boxborough. And we also appreciate you touching on existing buildings and some of the challenges of retrofits there and the opportunities as well. And um, we do have a question at the end of the webinar for everybody to see if there's interest in covering incentive programs for existing buildings as well, which we can also look to. And we have two more speakers for you today, and we're going to shift gears to residential new construction programs. So we're going to hear next from Keegan Ebbets. Um, Keegan has 12 years of experience working in the Massachusetts residential energy efficiency sector. He is currently the program manager for Massive Residential New Construction Programs with ICF. In this role, he works closely with the Massachusetts program administrators and also participates um, and also with participating HERS rating companies and residential buildings and developers. He oversees and implements the new construction incentives and the workforce development programs. So he's gonna cover um, single and multifamily programs today. And then we'll have one more speaker who can provide an example of a, a local project. So over to you, Keegan, thank you. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, and can you hear me okay and see my screen? Yes. Great. So Kim and Denise did a really nice job uh, uh, going through the overview of the commercial new construction program and sort of setting the table with the context and background for how these new construction programs work. So what we have with the residential program is very similar, um, but different in that it's uh, residential in nature and uh, how the program is, is divvied up in terms of building types and various incentive pathways. So with residential, we have five incentive pathways plus a workforce development initiative, which I'll touch on at the end. Uh, these five pathways uh, encapsulate all building types and uh, metering configurations, uh, including low rise, high rise buildings, uh, multifamily, single family. Um, our focus today is, is really going to be the enhanced incentives, uh, but I did just want to touch on the, the standard incentive paths as well. And it's important to note that these uh, programs are not just incentives. Um, much as Kim and Denise mentioned, uh, there are elements of technical assistance, uh, building code guidance, um, really just impartial third party consultation that uh, coming through these programs can provide to um, uh, builders, developers, homeowners, anyone really looking to do uh, new construction or uh, major renovations here in Massachusetts. Um, in Massachusetts, we have the benefit of a really uh, robust uh, strategy code, uh, when it comes to building code. Uh, so these incentive programs, for the most part, uh, are incentivizing folks to go above what is required uh, by building code. Um, so for uh, going beyond that stretch code uh, performance requirements um, is where the incentives are going to be driven from um, with these programs. So uh, one last uh, 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 preamble is that um, sort of categorical definition. So uh, uh, aligning with code, low rise is uh, buildings that are three stories or less and high rise is defined as four stories or more. And then single family buildings are uh, one to four unit buildings and anything uh, with five or more units is multifamily. 
Um, so with the standard low rise paths, there's uh, low rise new construction, uh, as I said, for buildings with three stories or less and residentially metered heat. Uh, for these uh, types of buildings, um, builders or developers, they would work with a program approved HERS rating company uh, to enroll in the program, uh, perform energy modeling, diagnostic testing, uh, and, and capture the, uh, the incentives. For those that don't know, a HERS rater is uh, basically an energy, um, energy consultation expert um, uh, governed by an organization called ResNet. Uh, they provide uh, energy rating indexes and uh, diagnostic testing and technical uh, advice on uh, new construction and uh, renovation projects. Uh, so high-rise new construction buildings uh, with four, four or more stories or uh, multifamily buildings that have five plus units um, with residential metered heat or any multifamily building that has a commercial meter, so master metered um, uh, heating configuration. Um, unlike low-rise, these are enrolled uh, via a program account manager. Um, so that is a, uh, an ICF representative um, who will work with the uh, developer point of contact Again, to enroll the program, uh, to enroll the project, provide uh, technical assistance, uh, and really just usher the uh, the project through the program, capturing incentives and um, and consulting on the um, performance specifications as they go. Uh, and then there's the renovations and additions path. So these are for existing homes. It does fall under the new construction umbrella, but it is for existing homes. So it's major renovations or uh, large additions to existing homes uh, for buildings with three stories or less and residentially metered heat. Um, we are uh, really looking for major renovations. So um, uh, certainly gut renovations, full remodels of homes are going to uh, qualify. Uh, things like bathroom renovations, kitchen remodels, uh, those are, are less uh, um, uh, pointed for what the, this program is looking to incentivize in terms of uh, the potential for energy savings. Uh, and similar to low rise, uh, they are enrolled and uh, capture incentives through a participating HERS rater. So those are the standard incentive paths. Um, so now moving to the enhanced incentive paths, we'll start with the all electric homes uh, incentive, which was launched in April, 2022. So it's less than a year old uh, and it is for single family and two to four unit buildings only. So uh, nothing with, in the multifamily designation with five or more units. Uh, so it's for new construction and major renovations. And when we say all electric, we mean truly all electric. So heating, uh, cooling, water heating, cooking, uh, clothes drying, clothes washing, uh, anything uh, in the house should be all electric. Um, similar to the low rise program, they are enrolled via a program approved HERS rater. Uh, the incentives for this are very, very robust. Uh, for single family homes, uh, they can range from $15,000 to $25,000, uh, ranging all the way up for four unit homes to $40,000 per building. Um, so there are two levels for uh, performance criteria, level one and level two. Uh, these are in alignment with the latest version of the stretch code that launched in uh, January of this year. Uh, so level two really starts to get towards passive house levels of uh, building performance. And level one is, is aligning with uh, the most recent version of the, of the stretch code. So when we're talking about the HERS index, we're looking at uh, indexes of uh, 45 for level one, and 35 for level two. And then we're requiring all electric, high performance all electric uh, uh, equipment for uh, space heating, water heating, um, cookware, really low infiltration rates. Uh, so these buildings are pretty airtight. Uh, there's not a lot of leakage or um, uh, air infiltration. And because of that, we do require mechanical ventilation, balanced, uh, so there's intake and um, uh, outtake. Uh, continuous insulation is optional for level one, but required for level two. So that does mean uh, when we say continuous, we're talking about uh, slab, uh, slab edge, foundation, exterior walls, roof assembly. So the whole building envelope um, has a continuous insulation level. Again, that, that really aligns with uh, passive house uh, levels. And then uh, lastly, 
electric vehicle ready. Uh, they don't need to actually install the charger to uh, qualify for these incentives, but they do need to be equipped with all the infrastructure, all the wiring uh, in order for a charger to simply be uh, installed easily um, post-construction. Uh, so just looking at the numbers to date, again, this launched in April, 2022, we have 287 units enrolled in the program, and we have already had over 130 complete. Uh, the vast majority of those were level one, 114, and um, obviously less in level two, which is to be expected since it's such a significant level of uh, performance, but we're, we're certainly getting there. Um, 17 units uh, completed with level two so far. Uh, so shifting to passive house. So now this is for multifamily buildings. So five units or more, uh, new construction, uh, seeking passive house certification through either uh, PHI or FIAS, which are the two uh, passive house governing bodies that operate here in the United States. Enrollment is via a um, program account manager. Again, that is a, an ICF representative who's going to work with the developer. Um, all of our account managers are certified passive house consultants. Uh, and part of this process is the development team will have an energy charrette with the account manager where they bring together the MEP, the architect, uh, the builder, the developer um, to have a, a charrette discussion around the feasibility and the uh, design for these buildings. Um, technical assistance is offered during this process as well. Um, and the incentives are broken down in a really uh, creative way so that there are pre-construction and post-construction incentives available to the developers to really alleviate some of the burden of um, pursuing Passive House, which really is sort of the gold standard when it comes to building performance um, here in the United States. Uh, so there are uh, incentives for feasibility studies. So if a developer is even just interested in, in saying, you know, hey, is this even possible for our building? Uh, the program will uh, incentivize them uh, up to 100% of the feasibility uh, study costs up to a max of $5,000. Um, Pre-construction energy modeling, there's incentives available for that. And then pre-certification with either PHI or FIAS um, is incentivized as well. And then when the uh, building completes, there are uh, post-construction certification incentives. And then for really high performing buildings, there's the net performance bonus, um, which uh, if they achieve a certain level of savings above our program baseline, uh, they get incentives on top of what they would have earned through the pre and um, uh, the pre-certification and the final certification. Um, so this program, Passive House Multifamily Incentive Program launched in uh, officially in kind of late 2019, but we kind of use 2020 as the real kicking off point. Uh, and since then, we have seen uh, just a tremendous uh, reception in the market in terms of interest in this program, uh, uh, enrollments, um, and actually completions so far. So we have three buildings that have completed uh, with uh, through the Passive House Incentive path, path here, representing almost 200 units. Uh, and right now we have 165 projects that are enrolled uh, pursuing Passive House uh, incentives. Uh, so that those projects are over the course of um, the next few years, all the way up to uh, 27 and 2027 and 2028. Um, there are significant lead, uh, lead times on these buildings. Um, some of these we're talking about uh, 10, 15, even 20 story buildings, um, hundred and hundreds of units uh, in some of these buildings that are pursuing passive house certification. So it was really a significant um, uh, uptick that we've seen in terms of the, the reception in the market. Um, really actually, you know, uh, uh, outperform uh, some of our expectations with it. So it's been really great and the, the feedback has been very, very positive. Um, so I think uh, that's, I'll, I'll move to the contact us page, but that segues into, uh, into our next speaker, Nate, pretty well. Um, so uh, we do have um, inboxes that you can reach out to us for each individual pathway. Um, that you can reach out with questions or enrollment uh, opportunities. Uh, so for low rise uh, and then high rise pass house renovations and additions, there are uh, individual um, addresses there. And I do just want to plug very quickly the uh, pass house and all electric homes workforce development initiative uh, is a uh, no cost training initiative that the sponsors of mass save uh, have put on uh, where we offer um, monthly no cost webinars 
trying to train the, the workforce. Uh, so builders, um, contractors, architects, homeowners, municipal officials, um, really just kind of getting the word out and uh, building that technical expertise needed to uh, transform the market in this direction and really decarbonize the residential sector um, in the passive house and all electric homes uh, areas. So if you're not already on our newsletter, I encourage you to go to the MassAid website and sign up for that so you can be notified of these uh, webinars as they roll out. Uh, really great uh, um, subject matter experts and some really exciting programming uh, coming up over the next few months. So with that, I will uh, shift to our next slide deck. I don't know what I did on the screen there, but uh, so Nate, I will introduce uh, Nate Dick from uh, Preservation of Affordable Housing. Um, or Julie, did you want to introduce uh, Nate or was that, was that me? Um, either way is okay. If you have his bio ready, feel free. Otherwise, I'm happy to jump in to share. Yeah, you can jump in. Okay, great. So our final speaker today is Nate Dick from Preservation of Affordable Housing or POA. Um, POA is a nonprofit owner, developer, and operator of affordable housing properties across the United States and based in Boston. They own and manage roughly 13,000 units of affordable housing across 13 different states. Nate has been at POA close to four years as an energy manager and oversees energy budgeting, targeting cost-effective discrete energy projects, and offering sustainable design support to organization experience um, organizations. He also has prior experience in utility energy efficiency program management, and we're really excited to have him here today to show an example of how um, the mass save incentives for residential construction can really support affordable housing in our communities, which is another priority for all of us, making sure we have enough affordable and abundant housing in our communities for everyone. So over to you, Nate. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Keegan. Um, and um, hello to everyone on the webinar. Thanks for joining today. Um, like Julie and Keegan mentioned, I, I work with an organization, Preservation of Affordable Housing. Um, we're, we're based in Massachusetts and we own and operate um, many uh, affordable housing locations in the state, um, regionally and across most of the, the Eastern United States. So this project is a very special one and it was facilitated by um, the Mass Safe Program and the Passive House Enhanced Incentives that Keegan discussed earlier. Um, this is going to be POA's first passive house project that's going to get completed. We didn't think it would be the first one. We have another project in Mattapan that's 135 unit um, passive house, striving to be passive house certified. But this one snuck in and, and uh, completed um, construction at the end of last year. Um, it's a 30 unit building, um, 30 unit across two buildings um, down in Brewster, uh, located in the Cape. Um, that specifically needs a lot of um, affordable housing. You know, the Cape has a lot of seasonal workers, a lot of um, real estate is, is starting to get very expensive. So there's, there's a need for housing for affordable residents, um, like the ones that are going to occupy the, these, these units in the future. So 30 units, um, seven of those are project-based um, vouchers. Um, that uh, that are provided to a, a residents that are going to have a 30% area under a 30% area median income. Um, additionally, there's three units that are going to be specific, uh, specific for residents with disabilities. Um, looking at just the total development cost of the project, it's about $450,000 a unit, so it's not inexpensive. Um, the construction hard costs were a little bit less um, once you sort of take out some of the acquisition and the design. Um, so just, you know, looking at that, it's, it's, it was a $300,000 cost per unit, um, roughly $240 per square foot. So we have to cobble together a number of different sources to facilitate um, this project to come to life. Um, one of which was Mass Save. And Mass Save is near and dear to us because, you know, like I mentioned, affordable housing isn't easy to finance. There's a lot of different pieces. And Keegan, if you want to click, there's an animation that shows the, the, um, some of the project um, partners that we worked with, including our partner, Housing Assistance Corp. Um, but we received funding from a number of different um, places, including MassWorks, um, you know, low-income housing tax credits that uh, are a bulk of the, the funding that are used to, to put this building together. 
Um, but you know, the passive house incentives, even though they may appear small in this slide, it was a $3,500 per unit offer that we were able to utilize to help offset and sort of, uh, you know, dissuade any fears related to striving to get to the standard. And for those that don't know passive house or are unfamiliar with it, it, it basically lays out specific heating and cooling demand targets. So, you know, you, you can't exceed in our climate zone, a certain level of space heating demand or a space heating energy, uh, same with space cooling energy. And there's restrictions on the amount of source energy um, that can be used per person. So it gives us a very tangible target to, to strive towards, um, but it, it really incorporates, you know, deep, deep insulation um, in our roof, in our slab, in our walls, um, an extreme focus on air tightness uh, to levels that, you know, limit any, um, any, any air infiltration that is going to come and uh, strip away energy from the building or bring in contaminants from the, uh, from the environment um, or reduce humidity levels to a point that they're going to make um, unhealth, unhealthy living uh, environments. So we focused on all of those things and the, the money that we got from MassSave was able to help us basically offset um, a premium which has been said to be one to three percent to go to passive house standard. Now, with some of the new legislation to uh, in, in increase the, the stretch code um, and improve it uh, and, and increase the performance requirements, you know, we're starting to get closer and closer. But passive house was an easy, tangible um, certification pathway that we use to um, to build this project. So you can go to the next slide. So um, and yeah, and this is just a just an image of the the foundation going in on uh, one of the buildings down in Brewster. Um, the like I said, the important thing for us was to commit to a target. Um, you can click on the next animation, Keegan. So some of the details on the walls, you know, these have blown in cellulose that's dense packed. It's six inches. Um, it's a very robust airtight assembly. That dotted line is basically tracking the, the air barrier across the, the roof and wall intersection. So extreme attention is paid to uh, making sure that there's no penetrations going through that air barrier. Uh, outboard of the wall, as Keegan mentioned, there's continuous insulation um, to give us that really, really deep um, wall cavity and um, give us the, the high performance and the limited energy inputs that we need to achieve the passive house standard. And then the final um, animation here just shows, you know, the targets for whole building air tightness. Um, you know, we have these very specific air, air tightness levels. And you can see in section D there, um, we designated an air sealing champion um, on the work site to basically be the point person to help navigate all the contractors and the various trades to ensure that the air tightness was maintained throughout the the project so um that's that's a really important aspect of achieving passive house which you know based on the the blower door test that we've done we're we're hopeful that we're going to achieve that um keegan talked about sort of the different phases of the the incentives so we got fifteen thousand dollars for uh modeling support to help us basically uh, work with our design team and lay out the design that we um, believed would achieve the, the passive house standard. And then within that modeling, we were able to determine, um, you know, the different areas that we needed to focus on to reduce our space heating and space cooling demand on an annual and on an hourly basis. Um, we layered in, you know, the different um, aspects of the building to ensure that we were going to meet that. And MassSave was able to help us um, provide support in that initial sort of um, modeling exercise to um, issue or get our pre-certification award from the Passive House Institute of, of uh, the, U the United States. Um, and at that juncture, we get another incentive from MassSave. I think it was um, 15, another $15,000 for that pre-certification. And a bulk of the, uh, the incentive will come once we get our final certification, which will, will be in the coming weeks. Um, so that sort of lays out that um, that pathway. We worked with the Hers Raider that is local in Massachusetts. 
Um, they also acted as our passive house verifier. So um, they provided technical assistance throughout the project. Um, you know, it's one thing to say we want to hit this this level of um, performance in our design. It's another thing to be in the field and actually see the, you know, the screws going in to see the insulation being laid, um, to see the the caulking and the foam that needs to be done to make sure that the the air tightness is maintained. Um, so they facilitate that and are there on site um, during the construction to help keep that quality assurance throughout the process. Um, and then the next slide is just some of the reasons that, you know, we went with Passive House, um, you know, it was a long-term investment. Um, Kate talked about, um, you know, some of the volatility in, in energy prices. That's another reason um, that we looked at it. I, I guess I'm skipping bullets here, but um, long-term investment for durability, you know, if we manage air and water infiltration levels to the degree that we are with this project, we're going to maintain the structure for a long term. Um, and we don't sell our properties. We maintain them for, their, for the long term uh, to maintain that affordability for residents and in the community. Um, so we're, we're interested in that and making sure that it has sustained performance. We're, you know, we're very um, focused on decarbonization throughout our portfolio and our operations. Um, in the Cape, you know, we've seen a lot of storms that have been impacting folks. Um, power's been down, not to point fingers at, at, at our at our favorite utility ever source, who I used to work for, mind you. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of weather issues sometimes when when the power is out, you know, and your heating or your cooling is out, you want to have long-term resiliency um, and passive house we feel gives us that security and that um, that safety when the power may be down for um, a day or two. Um, energy security, we have ability to leverage renewable energy on this project. So our EUI before um, our energy use intensity before applying that, that solar is about 18. Um, after the solar, the, the EUI is six. Um, or what it's projected to be. And, and I'm really looking forward to this project as well because it's all owner paid. So I can have all the data and look at um, all the energy use for the project without having to, to also get resident bills and factor those into the equation. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and as I mentioned, increased health and comfort benefits. I think another benefit that isn't really talked about a lot with Passive House is the the silence, the the sort of the noise um, canceling effects of having walls that are six inches thick um, and insulation and air tightness um, and high performance windows. So that is really, um, you know, an, an added benefit for our residents. Um, people spend most of their time indoors. This, this uh, chart in the bottom right um, it's from, I think, the national, it's from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and it was about human activity patterns. So we spend about 86 or 87% of time indoors. That's that's a good enough reason to make sure your, your environment is really healthy, um, where you're spending a lot of your time, which is your home. So it's another reason we want to go that way. So we thank uh, Mass Save for all the support that they provided us for this project, and as well as our other partners, um, you know. If I if I didn't mention them, so thanks thanks again for letting me join the webinar. Thanks so much, Nate, for sharing that really exciting example of achieving passive house and affordable housing, and all of the interconnections to health and resilience as well that you achieved. Really appreciate that. Um, we're going to shift to Q and A now, so I'll pull up all of our speakers on the spotlight, and I wanted to give the first question over to Senator Barrett. And for those of you who who may not know Senator Barrett, he was instrumental in creating and passing the Next Generation Roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy, among other leading climate bills. So we thank you so much for your leadership in this space, Senator. Um, and if you want to jump in with your question, please do. Well, thank you, Julie, uh, and thank you, Brooks. Uh, this is. Uh, a very useful program MAPC is putting on. And I want to thank all our all the speakers that you have. Uh, just two informational questions. Uh, one has to do with the EV subsidy uh, that Steve spoke to, Steve Conti. There was a mention, there is a mention, Steve, uh, in one of your slides of standard service. And I want to clarify whether communities, uh, many of them are within the MAPC service area, that 
offer municipal aggregation programs are their municipal aggregation customers who technically may move uh, in the case of Lexington where I'm speaking from, from Eversource to she is the municipal aggregation provider. Are all those folks who have moved to municipal aggregation still eligible for the EV home charger incentives or by referring to standard service, are you, are you indicating that those subsidies are limited to Eversource customers who remain on so-called basic service? Is Steve still on the call? Steve is on the line. We're having trouble pinning him um, into the spotlight. But Steve, are you there? I don't know if you had to step away for a moment. You know, he was having some connectivity issues earlier. But we know the answer. People who are in community choice aggregation programs are absolutely el eligible to participate. It's, you, that that yeah. is completely, as long as you're within the Ever, within Everstore service territory or national grid service territory or the other participating utilities, you're eligible. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kate. Uh, there, there was that reference. There is that slide that talks about standard service. So when Steve can connect, I'd like him to uh, reassure us and to confirm what you're saying there. <laughs> but that certainly makes sense to me. Uh, the second question I have is for um, Kim and Denise. I want to thank them both for being a part of this. Ten communities, at least, in Massachusetts are eligible not only to take part in the so-called specialized opt-in stretch energy code, the most exacting of the energy codes to be exact to be enacted by the legislature, but they've elected to be a part of a 10 community demonstration of electric construction, not as a opted in by the developer, which is available as we've just learned everywhere, but all electric as determined by the municipal government itself. At least seven of those 10 communities who are going to be pioneering all electric for new construction and for gut rehab across the entire stretch of the municipality, at least seven of the 10 are in MAPC service areas. Question to uh, Kim and to Denise is whether the mass save incentives that we've just heard about with respect to uh, residential and commercial construction are going to be available to those who take part in this um, all electric new construction as a matter of municipal opt-in demonstration program? Uh, or uh, will it be important for those communities? And we don't know who they are exactly because at least one of the original 10 West Tisbury has indicated it won't be associated affordable housing requirements and will be dropping out. The select board has indicated that as a formal matter. So we can anticipate that additional cities and towns will in the end be in this pioneering group of 10. Should they also adopt the net zero specialized stretch code in order to ensure that they're going to be qualified for incentives that, that uh, Mass Save is offering here? Or will those incentives be extended directly to communities that, as a municipal matter, decide to go all electric? Uh, thank you, Senator Barrett, for your question. Um, so the short answer to that question, and I'm, I'm speaking um, to commercial right now specifically, um, is that our uh, we've always been able to support projects, whether they're in stretch code territory, where they have um, you know, individual municipal, you know, targets or goals, um, we still support projects in those territories. Our baseline, if you will, um, is the state energy code, plus there's something called industry standard practice. Um, so we've, we've always been able to support, you know, we anticipate continuing to be able to support projects in gas ban territories or in specialized stretch code territories. That's our expectation. Um, it, I, I think it would be good for DOER to make that very clear. Um, so it might not be a bad idea to to get them to say that, um, but I do know that that's their anticipation. I mean, I think we we're here today because we wanna help communities. We wanna encourage them to adopt the specialized code. 
We want him to opt just, into that. Just to sharpen the, I and mean, I appreciate that. Just especially, there is a subset of communities that I do invite your attention to, and that these will be communities who um, are municipal light department communities for their electric power, and are going all electric for new construction with respect to heat, which basically means, as opposed to lighting, which means we won't be using gas. So in those cases, they wouldn't be using a Eversource or National Grid electric power because they're munis. Okay. And they wouldn't be using Eversource or natural or National Grid gas because they're going to go all electric and do heat pumps. Now they still will be using Eversource or National Grid gas with respect to current built right. environment, but but I want to make sure that the incentives for new construction might be extended even to those folks, and they would include Belmont, uh, Concord, well, you know who the munis are, there are about yep. 42 of them. Uh, what will happen to that subset, and how can they, since they will have a number of already built structures on natural gas, probably served by uh, mass safe members, are we going to be able to make sure that new construction incentives will be extended in those cases? Yeah, that that is a little bit less clear, Senator Barrett. Um, so the uh, historically projects, buildings had to be have had to be customers of one of the mass safe entities in order for us to serve them. Um, so that is something the exact scenario that you're describing is something that we are in. in deep discussions with and and um, are, you know, but right for right now, that answer is going to be a case by case basis. So we will talk to the well, individual. I, I, I appreciate the work you're doing. I noticed that Steve is with us. And I wanted to Steve, maybe you heard my question. I'm sorry, Senator, I had to step away for a moment. Could you please repeat it? Yeah, no problem. Uh, I noticed you had a slide entitled standard service. And uh, my question was whether uh, my constituents and the constituents of my colleagues who may now be using municipal aggregation programs to procure their electric power, even though they're an Eversource or National Grid's electric service market otherwise, will still be eligible for the residential EV charger sub. Uh, in my case, for example, uh, uh, I and many of my neighbors here in Lexington, Massachusetts are technically uh, customers now of Constellation because Lexington has a municipal aggregation program using a competitive supplier, Constellation, even though in some sense we're default customers of Eversource. Uh, did, did that standard service reference that one has to be on basic service and uh, mean that one must not have elected a competitive supplier? Right. For participation in our programs, uh, the site host would have to have an account with Eversource, an electric account. So whether that be a residential account for uh, participation in our residential rebate program or um, you know a commercial electric account for those incentives. So specifically, um, I, 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 of course, get my bill from Eversource, but it lists yeah. Constellation as my supplier. I believe that so would be okay. What's that? I believe that would be acceptable. It's just um, if you're a customer of Eversource, you can participate. So municipal aggregation customers will never be able to get the residential EV charger subsidy, you're saying? I believe so. I'm going to follow up on that, and I'll, I can certainly follow up if it's not the case, but I believe so. Hi, Steve. Steve. I, I can jump in. You got that, Mark? Hi, Senator Barrett. Yeah, Mark Rooney. I'm the Energy Efficiency Account Executive for Eversource. Hi, Mark. How are you? Um, and, and while your municipality may be getting their supply from a different uh, company, they are still getting transmission and distribution from Eversource. So they are still an Eversource customer. Ah, good point. Thank you for making that distinction. And thank you, Kate, for having spoken up earlier. Sure. And Steve, you might, I think the Senator's point, you might just look at the language on the slides, because if it says basic service, those of us who are community choice aggregation customers are not in basic service anymore. So that that may be a little bit confusing. And I think that may be what the senator picked up on. Yeah, and actually the term you used, Stephen, was a standard service, which which is, yeah, confusing potentially. Yeah, those uh, incentive level charts are uh, still being worked on 
uh, even as we speak. So I'll, I'll be sure to make that recommendation. That's good feedback. Okay. I want to thank, thank you, Julie, for letting me uh, take so much room. I really appreciate it and great program. Thank you. And thank you for all of your leadership. We deeply appreciate it. Um, so I know we are at the 1.30 hour, so what we wanted to do is just propose a quick wrap up. Um, we have two webinars upcoming that we want to let everybody know about um, on March 7th and March 16th. Our webinar on March 7th will be focusing and diving in more into how we can build affordable and sustainable housing. Um, and then our webinar on March 16th will focus on the energy efficiency conservation block grant program. So my colleagues will paste both of those links into the chat. And what we can commit to all of you is that we will email out all of these slides um, and the contact information for the various mass save and EV charging programs that were discussed today. And we also are really fortunate that our speakers were very active in the chat during the webinar and have actually answered many of the questions that have come in. So we will organize them. We already have been organizing them all into a document for all of you with the questions and the answers that we can send out afterwards. I mean, if there are some that haven't been answered, we'll do our best to find the answers um, to the degree we can and share that out afterwards as well. Um, and then we had a final closing question for folks I'm going to put in the chat. Um, we do want to keep offering programming that's helpful to all of you. So we did want to ask if there's additional information that would be helpful for you to know about Mass Save for your community. Um, for example, we were wondering if it would be helpful if we provide a webinar on programs for um, existing buildings that are available through Mass Save or other content that might be helpful for you. So if you'd like to add any feedback into the chat about webinars you'd like to see about Mass Save, that would be helpful um, or other topics that this discussion rose to you um, that would be of interest. Um, otherwise, I'd love to thank all of the speakers. Um, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Keegan. And thank you, Nate. Um, thank you, Senator Barrett. And we had a, a great lineup today. Thank you to my colleagues who helped run the webinar and to all of you for dedicating all of your time to learning about these programs. And we hope that this was helpful. and We look forward to being in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Let's see.